Chapter Twelve. When the moon rose that night, there was one spot upon which she palely broke, about ten miles distant from Warlock, which the forewarned traveller would not have been eager to pass, but which might not have afforded a bad study to such artists as have caught from the savage painter of the Apennines a love for the wild and the adventurous. Dark trees. Scattered far and wide over a broken but verdant sward, made the background. The moon shimmered through the boughs as she came slowly forth from her pavilion of cloud, and poured a broader beam on two figures just advanced beyond the trees. More plainly brought into light by her rays than his companion, here a horseman, clad in a short cloak that barely covered the crupper of his steed. Was looking to the priming of a large pistol which he had just taken from his holster. A slouched hat and a mask of black crape conspired with the action to throw a natural suspicion on the intentions of the rider. His horse, a beautiful dark grey, stood quite motionless with arched neck, and its short ears quickly moving to and fro, demonstrative of that sagacious and anticipative attention. Which characterizes the noblest of all tamed animals, you would not have perceived the impatience of the steed, but for the white foam that gathered round the bit, and for an occasional and unfrequent toss of the head. Behind this horseman, and partially thrown into the dark shadow of the trees, another man, similarly clad, was busied in tightening the girths of a horse of great strength and size. As he did so, he hummed. With no unmusical murmur, the air of a popular drinking song. "So death, Ned," said his comrade, who had for some time been plunged into a silent reverie. "So death, why can't you not stifle your love for the fine arts at a moment like this? That hum of thine grows louder every moment. At last, I expect it will burst out into a full roar. Recollect, we are not at Gentleman George's now." "The more is the pity, Augustus," answered Ned. So ho, little John! Wha ho, sir! A nice long night like this is made on purpose for drinking. Will you, sir? Keep still, then. Man never is, but always to be blessed," said the moralizing Tomlinson. "You see, you sigh for other scenes, even when you have a fine night and the chance of a godsend before you." "Ay, the night is fine enough," said Ned, who was rather a grumbler, as having finished his groom-like operation. He now slowly mounted. Damn it! Oliver looks out as broadly as if he were going to blab. For my part, I love a dark night, with a star here and there winking at us, as much as to say, "I see you, my boys," but I won't say a word about it. And a small pattering, drizzling, mizzling rain that prevents little John's hoofs being heard and covers one's retreat, as it were. Besides, when one is a little wet, it is always necessary to drink more. To keep the cold from one's stomach when one gets home. In other words," said Augustus, who loved a maxim from his very heart, "light wet cherishes heavy wet." Good," said Ned, yawning. "Hang it! I wish the captain would come. Do you know what o'clock it is? Not far short of eleven, I suppose. About that. Hist! Is that a carriage? No. It is only a sudden rise in the wind. Very self-sufficient in Mister Wind to allow himself to be raised without our help," said Ned. "By the way, we are, of course, to go back to the Red Cave. So Captain Lovett says. Tell me, Ned, what do you think of the new tenant Lovett has put into the cave?" "Oh, I have strange doubts there," answered Ned, shaking the hairy honors of his head. "I don't half like it. Consider, the cave is our stronghold and ought only to be known to men of tried virtue." Interrupted Tomlinson. I agree with you, and I must try and get Levitt to discard his singular protege, as the French say. Gad, Augustus, how come you by so much learning? You know all the poets by heart, to say nothing of Latin and French. Oh, hang it! I was brought up like the captain to a literary way of life. That's what makes you so thick with them, I suppose. He writes and sings too, a tolerable song, and is certainly a deuced clever fellow. What a rise in the world he has made! Do you recollect what a poor sort of way he was in when you introduced him at Gentleman George's? And now 
He's the Captain Crank of the gang. The gang? The company, you mean. Gang, indeed. You would think you were speaking of a knot of pickpockets. Yes, Lovett is a clever fellow, and, thanks to me, a very decent philosopher. It is impossible to convey to our reader the grave air of importance to which Tomlinson made his concluding laudation. Yes, said he, after a pause, he has a bold, plain way of viewing things, and, like Voltaire, he becomes a philosopher by being a man of sense. Hest, see my horse's ears. Someone is coming, though I don't hear him. Keep watch. The robbers grew silent. The sound of distant hoofs was indistinctly heard, and, as it came nearer, there was a crash of boughs, as if a hedge had been ridden through. Presently, the moon gleamed picturesquely on the figure of a horseman, approaching through the copse in the rear of the robbers. Now he was half seen among the sinuosities of his forest path, now in full sight, now altogether hid. Then his horse neighed impatiently. Now he again came in sight, and in a moment more he had joined the pair. The newcomer was of a tall and sinewy frame, and in the first bloom of manhood. A frock of dark green, edged with a narrow silver lace, and buttoned from the throat to the middle, gave due effect to an upright mane, a broad chest, and a slender but rounded waist, that stood in no need of the compression of a tailor. A short riding cloak, clasped across the throat with a silver buckle, hung picturesquely over one shoulder, while his lower limbs were cased in military boots, which, though they rose above the knee, were evidently neither heavy nor embarrassing to the vigorous sinews of the horseman. The caparisons of the steed, the bit, the bridle, the saddle, the holster, were according to the most approved fashion of the day, and the steed itself was in the highest condition and of remarkable beauty. The horseman's air was erect and bold. A small but coal-black mustachio heightened the resolute expression of his short, curved lip, and from beneath the large hat which overhung his brow, his long locks escaped, and waved darkly in the keen night air. Altogether, horseman and horse exhibited a gallant and even chivalrous appearance, which the hour and the scene heightened to a dramatic and romantic effect. Ha! Love it! How are you, my merry men? were the salutations exchanged. What news? said Ned. Brave news. Look to it. My lord and his carriage will be by in ten minutes at most. Have you got anything more out of the parson I frightened so gloriously? asked Augustus. No, more of that hereafter. Now for our new prey. Are you sure our noble friend will be so soon at hand? said Tomlinson, patting a steed that now pawed in excited hilarity. Sure, I saw him change horses. I was in the stable yard at the time. He got out for half an hour to eat, I fancy. Be sure that I played him a trick in the meanwhile. What force? asked Ned. Self and servant. The postboys? I, I forgot them. Never mind, you must frighten them. Forwards, cried Ned, and his horse sprang from his armed heel. One moment, said Lovett. I must put on my mask. Soho, Robin, Soho. Now for it, forwards. As the trees rapidly disappeared behind them, the riders entered at a hand gallop on a broad tract of wasteland interspersed with dikes and occasionally fences of hurdles, over which their horses bounded like quadrupeds well accustomed to such exploits. Certainly at that moment, what with the fresh air, the fitful moonlight now breaking broadly out, now lost in a rolling cloud, the exciting exercise, and that racy and dancing air of the blood, which all action, whether evil or noble in its nature, raises in our veins. What with all this, we cannot but allow the fascination of that lawless life, a fascination so great that one of the most noted gentlemen highwaymen of the day, one, too, which had received an excellent education and mixed in no inferior society, is reported to have said, when the rope was about his neck and the good ordinary was exhorting him to repent of his ill-spent life, Ill-spent, you dog! Gad! smacking his lips. It was delicious! Fee-fee, mister, raise your thoughts to heaven. 
but a canter across the common. Oh! muttered the criminal, and his soul cantered off to eternity. So briskly leaped the heart of the leader of the three that, as they now came in view of the main road, and the distant wheel of the carriage whirred on the ear, he threw up his right hand with a joyous gesture and burst into a boyish exclamation of hilarity and delight. Whist, Captain, said Ned, checking his own spirits with a mock air of gravity. Let us conduct ourselves like gentlemen. It is only your low fellows who get into such confoundedly high spirits. Men of the world, like us, should do everything as if their hearts were broken. Melancholy ever cronies with sublimity, and courage is sublime, said Augustus, with a pomp of a maxim maker. Now for the hedge, cried Lovett, unheeding his comrades, and his horse sprang into the road. The three men now were drawn up quite still and motionless by the side of the hedge. The broad road lay before them, curving out of sight on either side. The ground was hardening under an early tendency to frost, and the clear ring of approaching hoofs sounded on the ear of the robbers, ominous, happily, of the chinks of more attractive metal about, if hope told no flattering tale, to be their own. Presently, the long-expected vehicle made its appearance at the turn of the road, and it rolled rapidly on behind four fleet post-horses. You, Ned, with your large steed, stop the horses. You, Augustus, bully the post-boys. Leave me to do the rest, said the captain. As agreed, returned Ned laconically, now look at me. And the horse of the vain highwayman sprang from its shelter. So instantaneous were the operations of these experienced tacticians that Lovett's orders were almost executed in a briefer time than it had cost to give them. The carriage being stopped, and the postboys white and trembling, with two pistols, leveled by Augustus and Pepper, cocked at their heads, Lovett, dismounting, threw open the door of the carriage, and in a very civil tone, and with a very bland address, accosted the inmate. Do not be alarmed, my lord. You are perfectly safe. We only require your watch and purse. Really, answered a voice, still softer than that of the robber, while a marked and somewhat French countenance, crowned with a fur cap, peered forth at the arrester. Really, sir, your request is so modest that I were worse than cruel to refuse you. My purse is not very full, and you may as well have it as one of my rascally duns. But my watch, I have a love for, and... I understand you, my lord, interrupted the highwayman. What do you value your watch at? Humph! To you it may be worth some twenty guineas. Allow me to see it. Your curiosity is extremely gratifying, returned the nobleman, as with great reluctance he drew forth a gold repeater, set, as was sometimes the fashion of that day, in precious stones. The highwayman looked slightly at the bauble. "'Your lordship,' said he, with great gravity, "'was too modest in your calculation. "'Your taste reflects greater credit on you. "'Allow me to assure you that your watch "'is worth fifty guineas to us, at the least. "'To show you that I think so most sincerely, "'I will either keep it, and we will say no more on the matter, "'or I will return it to you, upon your word of honour, "'that you will give me a cheque for fifty guineas, payable,' by your real bankers, to bearer for self. Take your choice. It is quite immaterial to me. Upon my honor, sir, said the traveller, with some surprise struggling to his features, your coolness and self-possession are quite admirable. I see you know the world. Your lordship flatters me, returned Lovett, bowing. How do you decide? Why, is it possible to write drafts without ink, pen, or paper? Lovett drew back, and... While he was searching in his pockets for writing implements, which he always carried about him, the traveller seized the opportunity, and, suddenly snatching a pistol from the pocket of the carriage, levelled it full at the head of the robber. The traveller was an excellent and practised shot. He was almost within arm's length of his intended victim. His pistols were the envy of all his Irish friends. He pulled the trigger, the powder flashed in the pan, and the highwayman, not even changing countenance, drew forth a small ink bottle, and placing a steel pen in it, handed it to the nobleman, saying, 
with incomparable sang froid, Would you like, my lord, to try the other pistol? If so, oblige me by a quick aim, as you must see the necessity of despatch. If not, here is the back of a letter on which you can write the draft. The traveller was not a man apt to become embarrassed in anything, save his circumstances, but he certainly felt a little discomposed and confused as he took the paper and, uttering some broken words, wrote the check. The highwayman glanced over it, saw it was written according to form, and then, with a bow of cool respect, returned the watch and shut the door of the carriage. Meanwhile, the servant had been shivering in front, boxed up in that solitary convenience termed, not euphoniously, a dicky. Him the robber now briefly accosted. What have you got about you belonging to your master? Only his pills, your honor, which I forgot to put in the... Pills! Throw them down to me. The valet tremblingly extracted from his side pocket a little box, which he threw down and Lovett caught in his hand. He opened the box, counted the pills. One, two, four, twelve. Aha! He reopened the carriage door. Are these your pills, my lord? The wondering Pierre, who had begun to resettle himself in the corner of his carriage, answered that they were. My lord, I see you are in a high state of fever. You were a little delirious just now when you snapped a pistol in your friend's face. Permit me to recommend you a prescription. Swallow off all these pills. My God, cried the traveler, startled into earnestness. What do you mean? Twelve of those pills would kill a man. Hear him, said the robber, appealing to his comrades, who roared with laughter. What, my lord, would you rebel against your doctor? Fifi, be persuaded. And, with a soothing gesture, he stretched the pill-box towards the recoiling nose of the traveller. But, though a man who could as well as any one make the best of a bad condition, the traveller was especially careful of his health. And so obstinate was he, where that was concerned, that he would rather have submitted to the effectual operation of a bullet than incurred the chance operation of an extra pill. He, therefore, with great indignation, as the box was still extended towards him, snatched it from the hand of the robber, and, flinging it across the road, said with dignity, Do your worst, rascals, but if you leave me alive, you shall repent the outrage you have offered to one of his majesty's household. Then, as if becoming sensible of the ridicule of affecting too much in his present situation, he added in an altered tone, And now, for heaven's sake, shut the door, and if you must kill somebody, there's my servant on the box. He's paid for it. This speech made the robbers laugh more than ever, and Lovett, who liked a joke even better than a purse, immediately closed the carriage door, saying, Adieu, my lord, and let me give you a piece of advice. Whenever you get out at a country inn, and stay half an hour while your horses are changing, take your pistols with you, or you may chance to have the charge drawn. With this admonition, the robber withdrew, and seeing that the valet held out to him a long green purse, he said, gently shaking his head, Rogues should not prey on each other, my good fellow. You rob your master, so do we. Let each keep what he has got. Long Ned and Tomlinson, then backing their horses, the carriage was freed, and away started the post boys at a pace which seemed to show less regard for their life than the robbers themselves had evinced. Meanwhile, the captain remounted his steed, and the three confederates, bounding in gallant style over the hedge through which they had previously gained the road, galloped off in the same direction they had come, the moon ever and anon bringing into light their flying figures, and the sound of many a joyous peal of laughter ringing through the distance along the frosty air.